accueillir ici au séminaire à Montréal de Stefan Larsson de l'Université Gothenburg de, de, de la Suède. Stefan est professeur de linguistique computationnelle au département de philosophie linguistique et théorie des sciences de l'Université de Gothenburg. Il est également membre du CLASP, le Centre de recherche pour la théorie linguistique et les études de probabilité. Et il est aussi euh, cofondateur et directeur scientifique de Talkomatic, euh, qui, est, euh, qui, con, euh, qui conçoit des systèmes de contact vocaux spatiaux robustes. Ses domaines d'intérêt sont larges. Ils comprennent les systèmes de dialogue, le langage, la perception, la pragmatique, la sémantique formelle, la coordination sémantique et la philosophie du langage. Bref, c'est toute, toute, toute la gamme de sciences cognitives. Euh, ça, son thème est la signification et les classificateurs coordonnés et composés. Just a few words in English. Uh, you, you've already seen the, uh, the abstract and the bio, so I'll just quickly say that uh, Professor Larson is Professor of Computational Linguistics in the Department of Philosophy, Linguistics and Theory of Science at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden, a member of CLASP, the Center for Research on Linguistic Theory and Studies in Probability, and co-founder and chief uh, science officer of Talkomatic, about which he may or may not talk today. His areas of interest include dialogue, dialogue, uh, language and perception, pragmatics, formal semantics, semantic coordination, and philosophy of language, the full spectrum of cognitive sciences, and his presentation is meaning as coordinated and composable classifiers. Professor Larson. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for inviting me to the seminar. Um, it's an honor. I've been following some of the previous seminars, and uh, so I'm going to be talking about some like similar themes, of course, but from, a, I think, a slightly different angle than most of the other talks, like so from the angle of formal semantics. Uh, I have a lot of slides here, and I'm going to skip over them some some of them a bit quickly. But I want to keep them in the presentation for purposes of like answering questions, and if somebody wants to go deeper into things. And uh, another thing is that there is some technical stuff in here. I will try to explain it in ways that can, uh, because I understand it's an interdisciplinary seminar, and not you know everyone is deep into linguistic formalisms. Uh, I hope I can explain. Things, but feel free to ask uh, if there's something that's uh, you know that you need to know more about. So I'm going to talk about uh, first some introduction and then the, this formal uh, framework that I'm working in TTR, and then I will to be talking about these three themes: the classification, coordination, and compositionality. Um, so first of all, the questions that I'm interested in here is that how is linguistic meaning related to perception and also how do we learn and agree on the meanings of the words that we use and to explore these uh, questions we're developing so we is i'm i'm going to be talking about work here that i've done together with other people to a large extent uh, we're de developing a formal judgment-based semantics we know Notions such as perception and classification, judgment, learning, and dialogue coordination play a central role. And uh, the, a lot of this, uh, the, the origins of this work is from Robin Cooper, who you can see down there to the left. And uh, also some of this foundational work has been together with Professor uh, Simon Dobnik. So a key idea is to model meanings, perceptual meanings, as classifiers of real valued perceptual data and to train these classifiers in interaction with the world and other agents. So one uh, uh, starting point here or useful terminology is uh, Marconi 1997 uh, distinguishes inferential and referential meaning. So inferential meaning is uh, what enables you to infer stuff from uh, uh, uses of a word, sort of high level or symbolic and the stuff that you would typically model in formal semantics. So if you learn that someone uh, is a bachelor, you will know that it's an unmarried man, for example, uh, unless it's the Pope. 
then referential meaning allows speakers to identify objects and situations referred to by words. And that's sort of modeled uh, as a low level or sub symbolic on, on, that, on that level. And the hypothesis is that referential meaning can be modeled using classifiers that whose output is formal representation. So it's bridging that, that gap. So, okay, what is classification? We have two agents here looking at the color blob and they classify it as being a blue blob and they name it like that. But of course, you know, we can classify things differently. Someone else, one of the agents might think it's purple uh, and then if they want to like be able to distinguish different colors for some purpose, they need to resolve this, uh, this um, disagreement and coordinate. So they can talk to each other to resolve it and come to an agreement where they decide to call it blue or maybe to call it purple. So this classification can be coordinated. They might also actually end up calling it something else. Maybe they need a new word for this blue purple thing. So coordination can also be creative and go beyond what any of the agents had in at the, at the outset. So the fundamental idea here is that agents associate linguistic expressions with structured information. And by interacting and updating these structured information uh, that is associated with expressions, these agents coordinate on meanings. So, uh, Interaction in a shared perceptual environment we take to be essential to symbol grounding. And to the extent that they are sufficiently coordinated with respect to the task at hand, then these expressions have meaning. This is usually where I stop in my <laughs> attempt to define meaning. I don't actually say what meaning is, but I try to say when there is meaning. So it's meaning when people are sufficiently coordinated with uh, respect to a task at hand. Uh, yeah. So, and then how does that happen? Well, there is a multitude of procedures in natural language to enable this coordination. Some of it is overt and some of it is more hidden and going on sort of behind the scenes. Uh, and also the meanings of complex expressions such as a sentence is derived from the meanings of the constituents. So this is the compositionality. And this crucially then includes the perceptual meanings models as classifiers. So basically the problem that occurs here is like, how do you do compositionality for classifiers? So our task here is to provide a formal semantics and pragmatics that accounts for all of these things. But we also want to keep around because, you know, formal semantics has been around for about 50 years. It's been an accumulation of, of uh, insights and knowledge about natural language meaning and we don't want to throw that out but we also want to connect to recent work on machine learning for perceptual classification so that you know has been a big topic in uh, in machine learning like how to classify images and so on and how to um, like put descriptions automatically describe what's in the picture and so on. so we want to co connect to that so what is formal semantics? Because I'm not, not assuming that uh, the whole uh, audience is familiar with that. It's the study of meaning in natural languages using formal tools from logic and computer science and often with the hope of implementing something in a computer that can actually be useful. Um, so in formal semantics, there is a sort of received view, like the majority of papers being published uh, takes this uh, possible world semantics uh, approach. Uh, based on, on the tradition from Montague, Richard Montague in early 70s, who was the first to try to apply these form, formal methods to, to natural language in a sort of uh, systematic way. Uh, and one crucial thing in that kind of theory is that meanings of words such as dog is taken to be the extension of that expression. So the set of all dogs in the world. So this double bracket is often used for meaning. So the meaning of dog is going to be a set consisting of all the dogs in the world. That's actually a fairly extreme view on meaning because you're sort of saying that, you know, that that's all there is. There are just dogs. Uh, there is no idea of the dog. So as a research program, possible world semantics has in many ways been quite successful. Uh, 
Uh, yep. Stefan, we have one, uh, maybe it's premature, but we have one question mm -hmm. uh, concerning uh, results showing that the subdivision of categories, boundaries that define the extent of meaning based on coordination via communication is suboptimal. How, does, how do you reckon, reconcile with the function deri derived by, driven by uh, referential semantics? Uh, I think we should maybe better return to that question okay. at the end. The, the <laughs> I think it would be asked, easier. The person who asked it, Mao, ex agrees that it's premature, and I probably <laughs> mentioned it. So, yeah, okay. but it's it's yeah okay. I'm not and I'm not exactly sure I understood the whole question, but maybe let's let's uh, return to that a uh, bit later. Okay. Thank you. So. Uh, yeah, so I mean, this kind of semantics has been, uh, you know, successful in accounting for several things like uh, compositionality, quantification, modality, logical inference, and so on. On, other, on the other hand, it's been less successful in accounting for some other things like uh, the l relation between language and perception, semantic learning, vagueness. And in a, in a paper from last year, I argued that actually this idea that natural language words or expressions have de determined extensions uh, is actually not very feasible, but I'm not going to go into that uh, today. But uh, so what we actually want to model uh, is intentional meaning. So the intentional definition of word gives the meaning uh, by specifying conditions when it can be used. So, uh, or the general conditions which an object must fulfill in order to be not denoted by a word, that's Carnap's definition. And this possible world semantics doesn't really do that. It doesn't represent intentional meaning ind independently of, of extensions. Okay, so we opt for another approach, this type theory with records, but that still keeps around many of the insights from the possible world semantics. Uh, so TTR starts from the idea that information and meaning is founded on our ability to perceive and classify the world. So it's based on this notion of judgments of entities and situations being of certain types. So now I'm going to go a little bit into technical stuff. If you really don't like that kind of stuff, you can, you know, you can, I hope you will, I, I'm pretty sure you will be able to follow anyway, but I, maybe there are some people who are interested in this kind of thing. It's just a few slides of technical stuff. But uh, so the very foundational thing is, is uh, the, a judgment that something is of a type. So just write that like A is of type T. So that's a judgment. So what are these types? Well, one is type in TTR is in the type of individuals, and another is real, the type of real numbers and so on. And there are many other basic types. But then there are also complex types. So if you have T1 and T2 B of types, then T uh, being types, then T1 arrow T2 is a functional type whose domains is objects of type T1 and whose range is objects of T2. Now this looks uh, maybe a bit challenging, so but it's actually not that not that uh, challenging. I hope so. We ha so TTR is uh, has records and record types. So this is a record here. It has labels and it has values. And then this record is of this type, and you have the same labels here. If this object here is of this type, this object is of this type, and so on. Uh, and the only right. You can see that these things have are referring back to these labels. Why is that? That's because we have dependent types. So that's mo most easily explained by an example. So here's a record where we have uh, a referent, ref, which is an object. We have a, let's call it a constraint. Two constraints here. They are some, some kind of thing. Let's not say much about that yet. So this kind of record is of this type, provided that this object one, two, three is of type int. This S456 is of type man ref, but crucially this ref here is referring to this label. So, so this object is of this type, but this type actually involves this object here by, by referring. Okay, it's not as complicated as it, uh, it might sound. So, and another technical notion is that of a p-type. It's like a proposition, like the, the content of, of an assertion. So you can construct types 
uh, from predicates. So actually, this is a type. So, so predicates like run or man. And yeah, it's corresponding roughly to propositions of first order logic. And the fundamental type theoretical intuition is that something of a P type, P, so that's a predicate, and then some arguments, is whatever counts as a proof of that P type. So here you can say that S456 is a proof that this object one to three is a man. And S789 is a proof that that referent is running, that the object one to three is running. So now we're just using this S thing here. We're not saying anything what, what is a proof. Actually, we'll see later how low level perceptual input, like information derived from perceptual organs or technologies can be uh, proofs that were included in proofs. Okay. Okay, final technical thing. You can put types together, you can merge them. Uh, it's basically like conjunction. So if you have T1 and T2 be types, then T1 meet T2 is the me type. And something is of the me type if it's both of T1 and T2. And then you can also uh, put them together having this uh, merge operator. So it's, if you have this uh, record uh, type here and this record type here, you can merge them together into this. If they share a label, you will put a conjunction here uh, in the title. Okay, we're going to be making use of this later. If, if you didn't follow that exactly, don't worry. Uh, it will be possible to follow the rest anyway. Okay, now let's talk about classification and symbol grounding. So obviously this is not new to any follower of this seminar. So part of learning a language is learning to identify individuals and situations that are in the extension of the phrases and sentences of the language. That's one way of putting it. So for many concrete expressions, this identification relies crucially on the ability to perceive the world and to use the perceptual information derived from the world to classify individuals and situations as falling under a given linguistic description that is being part of the extension of that description or not. And this is, of course, uh, uh, the view put forward by Stevan in 1990 to address the simple grounding problem and that I, you know, I uh, for a long time I knew about this paper and I had read about it. <laughs> and when I finally got to read it, I was surprised to see that there wasn't just a problem; it was also a solution, <laughs> right? At least the start of a solution. And that I thought was also a very good solution. So, what do you need? You need a hybrid system encompassing both symbolic and non-symbolic representations. So now, obviously, I run the risk of misrepresenting. Uh, an author uh, in, in plain view, but uh, I want to take that risk. Uh, and the latter uh, representation such that they can pick out the objects to which they refer via connectionist networks that extract the invariant features of their analog sensory projections. And also learning non-symbolic representations. So in connectionist network that learns to identify icons correctly from the sample of confusable alternatives it has encountered by dynamically adjusting the weights of the features. And finally, compositionality, where complex constructions will all inherit the intrinsic grounding of the grounded set of elementary symbols. So basically, these are the ideas that we follow and specify further and, and try to formalize. Um, I mean, this specifically mentions connectionist network, which was, of course, you know, what people were doing then and actually what people are doing now again. But there are also other, other kinds of, of classifiers uh, around. Uh, so, what is perceptual meaning? We mean that aspect of meaning of some linguistic expressions, maybe not all uh, expressions have them, but for example, concrete nouns or noun phrases referring to physical objects do have perceptual meanings. And it's that aspect of the meaning which allows an agent to identify perceived objects and situations as falling under the meaning of the expressions or not. Uh, so that's one aspect of the uh, referential meaning. And we want to integrate perceptual meaning and low-level perceptual data into formal semantics. I finally so have one it... question. Yep. Uh, one question I think you will accept. By, com yep. compositional, by compositionality, do you mean the same thing that Jerry Fodor means? And could you just say in one or two meaning, one words what you mean by compositionality? Okay, so the compositionality principle is that the meaning of a com complex expression is the function of the meanings of the parts and the way they're put together. That, that's what I mean. 
So it's like how, if you know the meanings of the words in a sentence, how do you figure out the meaning of the whole sentence? Okay, thank you. So, yeah. I think that's what folder means as well, but I'm actually not sure about that. Um, wait, uh, yes. Yeah, so we want to mix this high level uh, and low level stuff uh, to, to have such a hybrid system as proposed. Uh, so to enable learning and coordination of perception meaning, then we need a framework where these where intentions are represented independently of extensions and that are structure objects that can be modified and that also include classifiers of perceptual data. That's the only way I can see that you can actually combine all these uh, desiderata. And as I mentioned before, possible world semantics doesn't really represent intentions independently of extensions, so it makes it not very useful. Uh, so classifiers are functions whose domain is typically numerical, so like a real valued or integer binary vectors, for example, that or like you know a digital image is actually is just you know it's numbers, digital. So and whose range is a set of categories or even or maybe a probability distribution over categories. And we will regard classifiers as at least part of representations of agents takes on intentions of linguistic expressions. Classifiers as intentions produce judgments whether some perceived thing or situation falls within the extension of a linguistic expression. This slide is just to point out that we know about related work. Uh, and since I have a bit too many slides, I'm going to skip over it. There's lots of related work, but not doing exactly what we're trying to do here. Um, uh, and I'm happy to return to that if somebody wants me to. So let's go into an illustration. Like, so we want to use this as a, a very base. Uh, yeah, I want to have like an example, a running example of perceptual classification. So suppose we have a square surface and you have objects being placed on the surface. And to classify an object, so then the task is to classify objects as being to the right or to the left. So to do that, we imagine maybe a robot directing a sensor like a camera towards the surface, getting a sense reading, a picture from the camera, camera applying some kind of transformation, returning a, a position of the object that you're looking at. So that's again, uh, actually just a two, two place vector. So that's like a higher refined version of, of what you're perceiving. You're now identified an object and you know its position. And then you apply, in this case, a perceptron classifier, super, super simple classifier to that coordinate vector and returning one or zero, depending on whether this object is deemed to be to the right or not. And here we like, this is the perceptron's idea of what's to the right or left, this line. So anything to the right of that is, gives you one as output. Yeah, so the perceptron is here used an ex as an example of a classifier, but this account is uh, general and you can basically use any kind of classifier. Uh, so uh, uh, classification of perceptual input can be regard, uh, regarded as a mapping of sensor readings to types, so the categories or types. And the perceptron, of course, is a very simple neuron-like object that takes a couple of, in couple of inputs and gives you one output, and you have a weight vector and an input vector, and if you multiply those and they exceed a threshold, then you get one out. So this is a very, as I said, simple classifier. It's limited to learning problems which are linearly separable. And we will at last, at least now assume that the distinction between left and right is linearly separable. Okay, how do we put these now into formal semantics? And um, we're gonna add a little bit to this example setting, uh, put it into a game. So, so this simple game is intended to capture some of the properties of first language acquisition. So you have two agents A and B, Facing a frame surface, A has a bag of objects that you can attach to the frame surface. Uh, so a round of the game is played as follows. A places an object in the frame. B looks at this object, uh, perceives it, and like, okay, you know, form some idea of this perceived situation. A says left or right, or, you know, more verbosely, this one is to the left, this one is to the right. B then interprets A's utterance based on, you know, with respect to the situation or B's take on the situation, yielding a P-type. So when he's, when A says this one's to the left, he's referring to that uh, object that you just put up on the, on the surface. And then B judges whether, according to B's take on the situation, uh, 
is of that type so that you know is is it actually to the right according to what the way b uh, sees it if it's not then b here being sort of the student assumes that a the teacher is right and defers and says aha oh it was to the right i didn't realize and then learns from that otherwise b says okay and they proceed okay. super simple but enough to illustrate some basic points so in first language acquisition, training of perceptual meaning typically takes place in a situation where you uh, have a shared focus of attention. Uh, so, the, uh, so we're going to limit the analysis to that kind of case for now. And we assume that the dialogue participants are able to establish a shared focus of attention. So this is something that infants can do quite early on. Uh, we assume that some simple sensor collects uh, sensory input from the environment getting a real valued vector. And we assume that this sensor is in fact oriented towards the object in the shared focus of attention. And we represent this then as a record. So here's our situation represented as a sensor reading, this position vector, and this focused object, object 45 in this case. Okay. So this position sensor just returns the two dimensional vector representing the position. So in S1, B sensor is orient, oriented towards an object 45, and the SR position sensor returns a vector corresponding to the position of object 45. Uh, now we can formulate the classifier uh, as a function with a, with a TTR type. And in fact, instead of a Boolean output like one or zero, we're going to have a, a P type as an output saying whether the object is to the right or to the left. So we have a function that takes a weight uh, vector and the threshold. Those are the parameters of the, of the classifier. It takes a situation where you have a focused object and a sensor reading, and it gives you back a type. So if you have the parameters of this type and you have some record of this type uh, reflecting the situation you're in, then this classifier taking those as arguments is gonna tell you that this uh, object uh, which is the value of this field in this record R, is to the right if the sensor reading multiplied by the weight vector exceeds the threshold. So that's the typical uh, um, perceptron condition. Otherwise, it's to the left. So this function here is defined outside TTR. In fact, you know that could be an arbitrarily complex computer program or deep neural network or whatever you want. Here, it's very simple. Of course, also, you know, other classifiers could be non-binary. That's not, uh, you know, if that's just an accident of this example. You could have like a fruit classifier that has many different uh, possible output categories. Okay, to set up sort of a little bit of machinery here to get the formal semantics going, we're going to assume that we can represent meanings <clears throat> um, for predicates. So a lot of a lot of expressions in natural language such, such as nouns, verbs, and adjectives can be modeled semantically as, as predicates. So the meaning of a predicate is going to have classifier parameters, uh, possibly empty record. Uh, it's going to have a background meaning. So that's a type representing basically <clears throat> the assumptions about the context of the utterance, uh, often referred to as presuppositions in linguistics. It's going to have an interpretation function. <clears throat> for contextually interpreting the meaning of something in context and the classifier classification function. So just a little bit of machinery here. We want to be able to look up uh, the meaning of a predicate for a p-type. So we have a p-type and it has a predicate and that predicate is associated with the meaning entry. So this just ignore the definition and look at this. So we have this predicate of this p-type that object 45 is to the right. And that's just saying, well, the predicate there is actually that uh, it's just that this predicate right with uh, that takes an individual. And then we can <clears throat> look at the meaning, predicate meaning for that uh, uh, predicate, take the right with the one argument who's an individual. And that's going to be this, for example, let's say now for the the game uh, we were imagining <clears throat> that we have parameters here with these specific numbers 
background, as we saw, saw before, these are the constraints on the situations where you can say uh, right. The interpretation function is something that takes a situation of this type, where you are looking at some object, and the output is a p-type claiming that that object, foo, r.foo, is to the right. Okay, so it basically the interpretation says, if you're looking at a situation which, where you're looking at this object foo and there is a sense reading, then the claim, what's being claimed here is that that object is to the right. The classification function, on the other hand, takes the same kind of situation, but gives output depending on the output of the classifier. So you're going to use that to actually classify the situation that you're looking at as whether it's to the right or not. And we use, again, these double brackets uh, to uh, just uh, represent the uh, interpretation function. So if you have the, the, the meaning of, of right here is just the, the interpretation function that you get if you look up the predicate right. Finally, we define the classifier related to So we want to be able to take a p-type, like saying that something is to the right, and look up the classifier that's involved in that. So that's going to look up first the meaning re related to the predicate involved in the p-type and then look up the classifier. So if we have this p-type again, that this object is to the right, well, the relevant classifier there is going to be this function. It's taking something again of this type and giving a result depending on the output of the classifier. OK, here is the sort of core thing uh, here, uh, the core definition of the paper. Uh, so if you look at sort of the vanilla TTR, which is in Robin's book, uh, if you're looking at the p-type, so what is, a, uh, what is of a p-type? What kinds of things are sort of proofs or yeah, of, of different p-types? Uh, it's, it's defined uh, as a set membership. So it's assumed here that, so it's, it's, you could say it's extensional in a way, but not in the same way as traditional formal semantics, because it's saying that for every p-type reflecting a proposition or the meaning of, of a claim or assertion, there is a set of proofs of that, or situations that prove that that thing is true. Uh, but what we want to do now is actually add to this that it's not always the case that you have already classified things as being of the p-type. You want to be able to classify new situations as being of the p-type. Uh, so then we say, well, if you're going to if you have a p-type t and you want to check if a situation is of that type, then look up the classifier corresponding to the type, apply it to that situation. And then if you get back the type, you can then you know <clears throat> then the situation is of that type. So you can make new judgments using this classifier function. Uh, you can also have these uh, keep around this witness cache of previous situations that you've judged. But this puts so this puts the classifiers at the core of TTR and at the core of the formal semantics. I realize that this might be a bit abstract now. So let's look at a concrete example how it actually works uh, in this game setting. So assume that our agent A places an object on the surface on the surface and says that one's to the right or just right. So here's the object. Agent B watches getting a possess position sense reading 0.9.1, so 0.9.1. And this is now a uh, beast take on the situation. So this is the sensory reading position sensor, and this is the object. And now B wants to interpret the utterance. B said that one's to the right. And that now, that refers to this object 45. So you want to interpret this in context. And, and since this meaning of right is a function that you can apply to situations, we're going to apply it to this situation. And it turns out that the output of that is this p-type claiming that this particular object is to the right. So when you say in this context, when A says right, or that's to the right, that means this object is to the right, because that's the one you're looking at. Uh, I mean, then you can sort of do a derivation here. Here's our big uh, meaning entry. The meaning of right is, you know, basically this function here. 
that we priest here and we just put in bg here is of course this function so that's uh, what it means and so we take that function we apply it to this s1 that we had here and that's going to work because the value of s sensor reading is in fact a real vector and this object 45 is in fact an individual so that's fine this is of that type this is of that type and then the output is going to be whatever uh, right the predicate right predicated of whatever is the value of foo which is object 45 so that's what we want okay we now interpret it in context good but the actual uh, more interesting thing is the classification so now we figured out what a meant now we want to see if what a said is true according to the way b sees the world can I intervene with one question from two feet? Yeah. Yes. What is the difference between a type and a predicate? Right. Good. Uh, so a predicate is something like uh, right. But a type here, a P type, is that a certain object is to the right. So it's something you could think of it as being true or false, where it's a type of a situation. So just right in itself that predicate doesn't express uh, a tr a, you know uh, something that that you would think of as being uh, true or false so, you know so basically a, a ty predicates are not types themselves but you can form types from predicates and arguments so those are called p types so so the idea here is that those are types of situations like if i say you know the glasses on the table uh that's a type of situation, and then many different situations can be of that type where a glass is on the table. Can, or, the, or, can the questioner yeah. just elaborate a little bit on the question? Uh, go ahead. Well, uh, thank, okay. Um, thank you for uh, the answer. Uh, I would like just to, um, as you know, there are a lot of definition for predicate and we can say that the predicate is a component of a phrase that brings together uh, a lot of objects that share the same properties for example red between bra brackets x x may maybe tomato maybe meat uh, and we can look at predicate as a type as well uh, and that I have a confusion to make a difference between predicate and type in your context. Thank you. Yeah, I understand what you mean. Uh, so you could say that right is the type of all things that are to the right. But that's not, it's just not the way we do it here. We simply use predicates to construct types instead. So, so here we okay. think of, of, of these P types as types of situations. So you can say that this situation is of the type where, where this object is to the right, rather than saying this object is of the type right. So, so okay, it's I see what, what do you mean by predicate. Thank you. Good, thank you, thank you. Good question. Um, right, so what happens in classification then? Again, this looks more complicated than uh, it is. I think. So now we want to see if the situation that we have here, S1, is of the type that's expressed by this claim. So A claimed that's that one's to the right. That meant in this context that object 45 was to the right. So it's this P type. Now we want to see whether this particular situation is in fact of that type where object 45 is to the right. So we want to see if this claim is true as it were. Uh, whether S1 provides evidence that object 45 is to the right is another way of putting it. So we said that if for, if for a P type, something is of the type, if you take this classifier that you can extract from the P type and apply it to that situation and you get the type back. So now we have this particular type, right, object 45, we, and we know that a situation is of that type if we can take this classifier, uh, this thing we had so before, apply it to that situ situation and get this type back. So let's do that. Uh, all right, now I got into this. Uh, I... oh, just a second. Oh, I hate this. 
once you get into this mode where the cursor starts moving up and down again instead um, you have to yeah we're, no we're not back okay i'll just go into that mode sorry for the extra stuff around the picture um right so let's check that um so now we take this function which was the the uh classifier function related to right and that's this thing uh so it takes something of this kind of situation that we saw and then it returns whatever you get when you take the classifier apply it to the parameters that we had and this situation that we're looking at and we apply this function so that's a lambda abstraction over r and this, we're going to basically instantiate r with this particular situation that we're looking at and when we do that we get this so this is the calling the left to right classifier with the first argument being the the parameters again and the second being the situation and that will return according to the definition uh, right object 45 if you multiply this number with or this vector with this vector and it exceeds this threshold and in this case it does so you get that result so s1 turned out to provide evidence that object 45 is to the right so here we see how this propositions of types of proofs works so the situation s1 is proof or evidence of the p type uh object right object 45 which was expressed by uttering right in this situation so this is what happens in the dialogue right okay now it's a bit unfortunate i realized that this right can also take be taken to mean many other things it's ambiguous but here it means that one object is to the right that's the basic that's like the core stuff here that's what we build all the other things on top of. Uh, and I now realize I have like uh, much less time <laughs> than I had hoped. But I, so I will simply go through basically what I take to be the most important things for the rest. So one thing is that this is very, uh, you know, on or off, like it's true or false, or it's of the type or not of the type. What you really want is to model vague concepts because, you know, most or all concept, concepts in natural language are vague. So there we I've done work together with uh, Raquel Fernandez where we formulate the Bayesian noisy threshold classifier for Bayes concepts in, in TTR and it's also context sensitive because you need that uh, with a lot of concepts like you know tall for a skyscraper for a human etc. So in this case instead of a binary judgment the classifier returns a probability distribution over p types. And to do this we have a, a probabilistic version of TTR prob TTR uh, and there's a paper about that. We're actually still working on uh, improving and developing that further. And Robin just did, uh, posted an implementation the other day. I haven't had time to look at it yet. Uh, yeah, so this is how things look there. Basically, you, you, you have a noisy probabilistic threshold. But let's not go into details, but you get probabilities instead of, of uh, categorical judgments. Uh, another thing that happened was that some students built actually, you know, this is a very uh, abstract thing still with this game. They actually built uh, on top of T the TTR implementation that uh, we have that Robin did, built uh, and using these ideas presented here, uh, on, Im implemented there uh, to classify actual pictures and like test whether uh, something holds true of that or, or not. And you can do that in different ways. So that's. Uh, Ronja Utescher and uh, Aril Matson who did that work. And then you have like, you know, you have an actual image, JPEG, and you have like a frame, and, and you can then classify that as being a, 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 of a type. So, so you know, it works in, in sort of more real, uh, real life cases as well. So, uh, yeah, so one thing you want to generalize this, of course, uh, to probabilistic classification. We want, of course, to be able to parse into, T uh, into TTR with perceptual meanings, like take natural language and parse it into these abstract representations. That's also related to compositionality. We want to remove this limitation of talking about the here and now that was inherent here, and there's some work towards that. 
uh, and then uh, there are plenty of sort of uh, shared tasks about question, visual question answering, visual, visual dialogue and so on going around now and people are only using like deep uh, neural networks and we would like to see if this kind of hybrid uh, approach can, could help. Another thing is of course that okay. classification is not just okay. perception. Okay. Yeah. Just to tell you, don't worry too much about time because you've been taking pe questions as you go along. So yeah, in that okay. You. Okay, thank you. Uh, another thing that we haven't really gone into yet is the fact that classification isn't just passive perception, but also includes action, like you might want to lift something and twist it around. So, so that makes things a bit more complicated. Okay, that was the basic idea about classification, how you put these classifiers into formal semantics and what role they play. Now, uh, what about coordination and learning? So uh, we've been working with this idea of semantic coordination for a while. Uh, and that, of course, takes its cue from, from work in other fields. So in psycholinguistics, for example, uh, people have been working on alignment, showing that uh, agents negotiate domain-specific sort of micro languages for the purposes of discussing whatever particular domain they have at hand. And this is often, you know, in everyday language use, not very salient to us because we often talk about things that we've talked about before and then we already know more or less how to talk about it but when we talk about something we haven't talked about before or we talk to some someone who we haven't talked to before about the thing then you actually are doing this kind of negotiation and, and coordination so semantic coordination is the process of interactively coordinating on the meanings of linguistic expressions uh, sorry back there. So basically in dialogue you have two kinds of co information go uh, coordination going on. One is that you're coordinating on information like you're exchanging information, what's true, what are the relevant questions you're, uh, yeah. and you're, you're making sure that you're being understood and so on. But the other kind of coordination that's going on is coordinating on, coordinating on the language, how to talk, you know, like which enables the, the information coordination and this includes semantic coordination. And uh, so, as I mentioned, semantic coordination can occur as just a side effect of just talking about the sort of object, the, the situation that you're in, not talking about language. Like you're just acknowledging, clarif clarifying if you don't understand, you're repairing each other's utterance and correcting them. And you can even learn uh, a new language by just observing someone else and like silently uh, coordinating. So, oh, oh, I th guess they mean this when they say that. So I'm just going to adapt to that more or less consciously, of course. But there are also dialogue strategies whose primary pur purpose is to aid semantic coordination. And those are particularly visible, of course, in first language acquisition, also in second language acquisition, although we look less at that. But it's also available, uh, for example, in online discussion forums. So. Uh, uh, Jenny Myrendal, a former PhD student, wrote her thesis looking uh, uh, at semantic coordination in online discussion forums because you have people who don't know each other discussing more or less controversial topics and they often get into talking about what words mean. It's, uh, very interesting stuff. Not directly, well, okay, yes. So let's look first at first language acquisition example. So this is from work by Eve Clark. Uh, so she identified lots of different strategies that, that children have uh, to sort of uh, coordinate and learn meanings. So here you have um, a child, D, putting, uh, so this, uh, so I don't remember now exactly how these code, age codes work. Anyway, ignore that. So D, child, put his shoes on and points at some ants to the floor and says, ant, ant. And the father says, indicating a small beetle nearby, and that's a bug. And D says, bug. Okay, so just sort of pointing to something and saying what it is, and then often as a signal of uptake of that, the child repeats the word. Uh, it can also be a kind of repair or sort of cooperative repair. So Abe says, I'm trying to tip this over. Can you tip it over? Can you tip it over? Mother says, okay, I'll turn it over for you. So sort of subtly introducing the more correct word turn rather than tip. Uh, there can also be clarification requests like, mommy, where my plate? Oh, you mean your saucer. 
again, sort of subtly uh, without saying you're wrong, you know, but just sort of subtly introducing the correct word. Uh, uh, so, so, you know, from one perspective, what's happening is that you're getting the right word for a given meaning, but it also means adjusting the meaning of the words uh, or idea of the meaning of the words. So learning meaning. Uh, you can also uh, do a more, uh, you know, confrontational strategy, like Naomi says, birdie, birdie, not a birdie, a seal. So again, you, know, you would expect Naomi to learn something from that about the meaning of bird and seal. And they can even be just bare corrections, like mittens, gloves. So we've done some work on this kind of uh, acquisition in TTR a, couple, quite, yeah, a few years ago now. Uh, So, but how did, would that work in our language game? So we had this uh, meaning uh, of right that looked like this. You have these uh, parameters of, of, the, of the classifier here for being to the right. That's part of the meaning of right. Let's now continue with the game. Now, th this time, uh, A puts a new object here, okay, and says, Right, this one's to the right as well. So this gives a new sensor reading. These are the new coordinates. It's also a new object. Uh, and as before, uh, B computes the contextual interpretation. It means when, when, when A says that one's to the right in this context, it, it's now the claim that object 46 is to the right. Next, B wants to see if this correctly describes her take on the situation. So is this situation two of the type that you get if you interpret the utterance in context? So is it of this type? That would you, is it evidence that object 46 is to the right? And if you go through the whole derivation as we did before, it turns out, no, this time it's actually to the left. So the left or right classifier now returned that object 46 is to the left. And we can see that because it's to the left of this dividing line between left and right that B takes to be you know, the meaning of left and right. So uh, A's utterance doesn't correctly describe B's take on the situation, but B is, uh, is, is, is learning and uh, trusts A to know better. So A, B will learn from this by updating the weights uh, used by the classifier perceptron and then you can just use the, there is a standard perceptron training rule and any kind of classifier or classification method or deep neural network has uh, uh, different ways of updating the network uh, based on based on observations so um, and uh, basically you compute uh, uh, like a vector corresponding to taking into account the target output the actual output uh, and the input. <clears throat> so this is what you perceived. This is what the teacher said. This is what you thought. And then you compute an update based on that. And I'm not going through the details of that, but it's going to end up updating your weight vector in the meaning of right. So now that that that's how you see that that something changed as a result of of learning here. And that, uh, if you make it into a picture, means that you move this dividing line a bit to the left. And now this object is actually to the right of that line. So now B said, aha, indicating that B learned something. OK, so this is asymmetric, of course. B is learning from A. Uh, uh, but when humans interact, uh, when adult humans interact especially, they mutually adapt to each other's language use on multiple levels. And this is evidenced by, by the work I cited before from, from psych psycholinguistics. Uh, and and uh, in fact, it's quite easy to alter this game to illustrate coordination directly. You just uh, make A and B switch roles after uh, each round, and and that means you know, well, in in the kind of asymmetric version we were looking at, uh, B will ideally end up with the exact same meaning for right that A had at the beginning. But if they are learning from each other, then they are probably going to end up with a meaning for left and right that's different from what any of them had to begin with. Um, let's actually skip that. Yeah, uh, but not. So 
one thing to note is that in this game, the left or right game, coordinating on the meaning of left and right is, is sort of the, the main goal of the game. It's like a learning game. But of course, it could also occur as a side effect of doing something else. Maybe you have a game where you need to give me the left cup, give me the right cup. Oh no, that, that's not the left cup. You know, so you could uh, I did, like a side effect of identifying objects. You can you can learn meanings as well. It doesn't have to be the goal of the dialogue to learn meanings. It can happen anyway. Uh, <clears throat> right. So I want to say a few words about this work that Jenny did for her thesis and that we continue to work on together after that. Uh, basically, uh, the idea is to sketch a general account of dialogue acts for semantic coordination, like these strategies that people have when they discuss meanings of words. Uh, so Jenny, in her thesis, uh, found a number of strategies. Uh, there's a list later, and we tried to sort of put that taxonomy together with with uh, the one by uh, Eve Clark and colleagues. So that's in that 2017 uh, paper. Because uh, presumably there's like a, a, a universal um, inventory of strategies for, for learning. Um, well, universal is a, is a big word, but you know, yeah, a, 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 an inventory of strategies for, for negotiating and learning meanings that, and some of them are employed in first language learning, some are employed in semantic coordination among adults and some in both. Uh, and we also want to connect those uh, dialogue acts or these different ways of doing uh, negotiating meetings with updates to the meaning representations like we did now with, with, the, class, with the classifier. Um, yeah, so what Jenny observed was that people engage in these word meaning negotiations. It's, there's a trigger word that they start discussing uh, and then, uh, you know, they, they can either be cooperative and end up, okay, that's now I understand what you meant, or they can continue to disagree because there's some kind of uh, something at stake that you that you don't want to lose, the like defining the words as part of winning the argument. And then those discussions can, can go on forever. So the kind of uh, taxonomy that Jenny was looking at uh, was, okay, so you have something called explicification or just explication, where you basically provide some kind of definition uh, or you can give examples, exemplification, like providing examples. And actually what we saw in the left to right game was in a way providing examples. This is an example of being to, to the right. This is an example of not being to the right. You can also contrast the word with another word. Uh, this is not to the right, it's to the left. You can, uh, you can just oppose, like, no, you're wrong, that's not to the right. You can ask for clarification and you can endorse word. You can, just, uh, you can just use a certain word to show that you're endorsing using it. Uh, and that's you know often done in sort of political context, like political arguments. You, you use a word that has certain connotations to signal your, your uh, It's part of, of winning the argument. And uh, Bill Noble is working on continuing to develop this, uh, his PhD student uh, of mine now, uh, developing this kind of taxonomy uh, further. I'm going to skip a little bit here again. Uh, so, uh, so what we want to do with respect to coordination is to work out then a general and reliable uh, taxonomy or annotation schemas for semantic coordination strategies in general and relate that to updates to meanings in a way that works both for high level inferential meaning. So that can include giving explicit definitions, but also for low level referential, including perceptual meaning, like the kind of thing we saw in the left to right. We also uh, uh, want to be able to automatically detect semantic coordination strategies in dialogue, and also, of course, enable artificial dialogue agents to participate in semantic coordination in dialogue. So yeah, that's where I can mention Tokimatic, I guess. So, you know, a well-known problem with dialogue systems is that they only know the language they've been programmed or trained. They can't learn a new language by talking to people. And that's what we do all the time. So that would certainly be a big help if, if like, say you have a household robot uh, somewhere in the maybe not too distant future that you want to tell how to do different things and you have to explain to it and make it understand what you mean when you talk about like cleaning different parts of your home or whatever. So, 
another uh, thing is that, of course, word meanings don't exist in isolation. They hang together in larger sort of structures or semantic systems that encode a perspective on a situation and an activity. And that is sort of now we just looked at these words in isolation. So changing the meaning of one word is going to change the meaning of another word. In the left or right game, it's obvious. Like if you change the meaning of left, you're, uh, right, you're also changing the meaning of left. So that needs to be taken into account. And we didn't say much about that yet. Um, another thing is, of course, how do agents figure out, like if you say something and the other person in, indicates more or less explicitly that there's something wrong with your utterance, that's not how you should use that word. You don't have the right idea. Uh, right, that's actually another problem than the one listed here. But okay, so one thing is like, how do I figure out what was wrong with, with my uh, my meaning sort of? Uh, a part of that is to figure out what classifier you train for a given word. How do I even know that right is about position rather than color? Uh, so that's, uh, and there are various clues like how how children do that. One thing is you can know, uh, like have ontological knowledge, you know what kind of kind of thing something is, like, uh, uh, it, yeah, you can even be told that red is a color. Uh, but you can also learn this from interaction more, more subtly. And like, there might also be biases, like infants have a shape bias, so they take, uh, they are, uh, biased to take words to refer to shapes rather than colors initially. Um, uh, yes. Could I suggest maybe, uh, as I said, you had more time, but to make yeah. this, to use this remaining time more economically, uh, leave aside the details, the, the papers yeah. can be read, and yeah. give uh, the, the generalities that might be useful in, in the 20 minutes of com, com, com discussion that we still have left. Yes. Let me then skip to compositionality. That's my last uh, last point and try to go over that. Yeah, so here's a quote from you. <laughs> I just want to emphasize, I, I have these quotes in my talks, not just when I give talks here. So, <clears throat> so uh, you know, categorical representations cannot be interpreted as meaning anything. It's true that they pick out the class of objects the name, but names don't have all the systematic properties of symbols and simple systems. They're just an inert taxonomy. For systematicity, it must be possible to combine and recombine them willfully into propositions that can be semantically interpreted. Yeah, so if we have something that doesn't just have one word, like right, if we have several words that have perceptual meanings, how, how then do you put them together? And... Uh, Let's just take this left and uh, right game and add like upper and lower. So now we have, okay, here's the meaning of right. Here's the meaning of upper. It calls an up, uh, upper or lower classifier instead. So if someone says upper right, it's to the upper right. Well, then we can just combine the meanings of upper and right using this merge operator. So it's just going to basically, you know, you need to be classified as being, you need to merge, you, you need to classify both both as being upper and to the right. So that's a very simple kind of compositionality. It's basically just conjunction, like upper right means upper and right, like this, okay? So if it's upper and right, it's here. That's not very problematic. However, there are other more interesting cases, like what if you say it's to the far right, not in the political sense, in the, in the position sense uh, here, uh, geometric sense. That's, it, that doesn't mean far and right, right? It means, far somehow modifies right. And we can model that here by, and I'm definitely not going into the details here, but, but basically the meaning of far is a function from a meaning to a meaning. And what it does is to, is to change the threshold of, so if you take right being this, and then you take far right to provide a new threshold, it increases the threshold, thus pushing the 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 line here to the to the right. So if right means this, then far right is going to modify that classifier into new classifier looking like this. So that kind of compositionality is more challenging, right? And then that can be presumably become quite complex when you combine different modifiers like that. So to cover compositionality, you, you need to not only cover this kind of simple intersective compositionality, like upper and upper right meaning upper and right, but also this, what I call non-intersective compositionality, uh, where, where you uh, 
have more complex relations between uh, the meanings. Uh, you also want to be able to account for learning perception, meanings, vagueness. And if you're com into computational stuff and want to build robots, you want to be able to use the best classifiers and make it work with them. Uh, yeah, so I'm skipping over a few slides here. So far, we haven't seen any account of compositionality for perceptual meanings models as classifiers that satisfy all the desiderata. And even the one that I showed now is not great because, well, it fulfills everything except you can't really use it with these deep learning classifiers because there you have, you, you can't like m manipulate parameters of those classifiers in a, in a way that you understand because by definition, the weights in those networks are, don't, that it's very hard to figure out what they do. So you, it's hard to know how to modify them. We have some ideas toward the solution there, but we haven't uh, published that yet. Uh, you can also think about how compositionality and learning interact uh, because if, you know, that's not to the far right. Well, is that because it's not, I have the wrong meaning of right or the wrong meaning of far, or to know. And how can you use definitions in learning uh, compositional meanings? Like how can you learn rather like this? If you define, if you give a definition, you, that can be used to learn a new meaning, but then you need to understand that definition. That definition is going to be a complex expression that you need to interpret compositionally. To conclude, we described work on formal semantics for perceptual meanings, meaning coordination and compositionality for perceptual meanings. And hopefully the message came through that TTR is well suited to modeling agents that coordinate on information on informational language, including perceptual meaning, and also that there is still a lot of work to be done. Thank you. Thank you very much.